Hello, welcome back to the On Stage Colorado podcast. I'm Alex Miller here with arts reporter Tony Tresca. Hey, Tony, how's it going? Hey, Alex, a long time no see. How's, how's it been going yeah. with you? All right, just been uh, busy doing this and that. And uh, yeah, uh, so we took the week off. And uh, um, did you get any blowback from people that outraged I- that we didn't? <laughs> I, I know it. only one one concerned text message from a fellow and fabulous arts and culture reporter over at CPR, Eden Lane. She reached out just to make sure that nothing had happened and uh, the podcast would be returning. And so to you, Eden, and any other concerned listeners out there who uh, we were we were just rest assured we're all good. We just took some time off for family affairs. Yeah, yeah. There were some people picketing outside my house, but I, I assured them that we'd be back. So. Oh, thank goodness. I'm glad you were able to quell the protesters. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like I like I mentioned, I think last time my son Andy, who's often my plus one at the theater, has moved to Guam for a six month contract working at an island resort there. So, uh, so we were doing a bunch of kind of going away stuff with him and getting you know helping him get ready and and all that. The picture you sent of him uh, on the beach in Guam, he just looks so natural. He fits right in <laughs> on the beach with it, with his yeah. Hawaiian shirt on and just glass sunglasses. He looks like he's going to have a bit six months up there. Yeah, yeah. I was I was often compelled to tell Andy, if we were going to maybe the Denver Center or something like that, I'd, I'd be like, Andy, come on. You got something other than a Hawaiian shirt or, or at the very least, uh, flatten your collar out a little bit. So so anyway, well, where where were you? You were in New York, I, right? Yeah, I was uh, I was up in New York for my cousin's graduation, which I actually did. I ended up watching from the bar next door with my sister via live stream. <laughs> I know, but I was like, I flew to New York for this, but we ended up only there as a small graduation, so they only had a limited number of tickets. I have a very big family, and so uh, me and my sister and a couple of other folks had to. We watched via live stream. Uh huh. So but, probably yeah. a, very rare for being able to watch a high school graduation and have cocktails at the same time, huh? I, it was very, it was a wonderful experience. I had a great time <laughs> with my sister. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So, and the rest of the trip was really good too. I was over in the Long Island area, and so I caught up with a bunch of my family who I had not seen since like a lot of them before the pandemic. So that was that was good. Wow. Yeah. You know, that's where I grew up. I grew up uh, not too far, I think, from where you were. You're in Islip, right? That That's area. right, East Islip area. My dad used to take us out to Islip Speedway and we'd watch the would watch the figure eights mm-hmm. and the crack up derbies. <laughs> yeah. Uh he loved that stuff. So uh anyway, well um yeah, I think we were both out at the theater last night. I saw uh Buntport's uh show. Uh so they're doing this um they're calling it testing one, two, three, and they've got three different shows. The one last night was called the game show game show show or something like that uh and and uh it was really funny it was like an hour of of uh, uh them t- testing out different game show formats that everybody knows like they did a family feud they did a taskmaster which apparently is a really popular thing that i just recently heard about uh it's like a british show I've never or something. Heard of it. yeah and then they did uh they did a little they did, did a round of trivial pursuit uh and so uh so yeah it was it was funny it was um uh you know, a couple of the regulars, uh, um, Aaron Rollman was the, uh, MC and, and mm-hmm. Eric, uh, Eric Ed Border was sort of like the, I don't know, the s- stage hand. And he also played a giant sweat sock <laughs> at one point. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that then, uh, like classic bump for it. <laughs> yeah. And then Brian was, uh, Brian and, and Hannah Duggan were on the other team. And then, um, uh, a uh, fellow named Evan, and then uh, the woman from the King Penny show, uh, Libby, uh, was on the other team. So it was it was a really it was a great cast, very very uh, just very silly, very fun, and uh, and so yeah, I'll uh, I'll be doing a little something about that. So what were you at last night? I was over at the Denver Center in the Garner Galleria Theater uh, to see Broadway's next hit musical, which is. Ah. In- an improvised show. I think I, I think you're going to see this one uh, tonight, well, yeah. tonight, right? Yeah. yeah so it's June we'll 15th as notes. we're speaking, by the way. So that's the reference point. Uh, Saturday, June 15th. So what yeah, what do you think? I thought it was interesting. I I thought that the the first half, and so the first half features us. Uh, they take suggestions from the audience in the lobby where you write down song titles that you'd like to have them improvise and. 
be totally honest, the first two suggestions from the songs were kind of a little bit lame. And so I think that kind of affected the scenes. But then the second, the third song ended up being from this hilarious musical, The Pasta King. It was this, <laughs> what the hell is this number? Uh, and that that ended up being really high point of the show. And that was the musical that ultimately the audience voted that they wanted to see fully produced in the second act. And so we spent the second act in the ni- world of 1916 New York, uh, watching the Pasta King battle the Pasta Queen. Um, <laughs> and so you know, it was pretty funny. The, the All of the melodies were very put together. Um, but yeah, I think that the interestingly, the weakest part, and they made a joke about this at the start of the show. They were like, listen, uh, so see, we're taking your song suggestions. If, uh, if the show's not funny tonight, it's actually because you guys aren't funny. It's and your I was fault. like, I felt that. I felt that with those first two. <laughs> Always blame the audience. And you know, it's the, it, when in doubt, that was the, that was definitely the host's go-to strategy. Every time a joke was bombing, he would just uh-huh. turn on the audience. That's great. So, so the first act was kind of like testing, testing a couple of ideas, and they, they pick the best one, and then the second act they expand on it. That's right. So the framing device is the first act is at the phony awards, and so they're doing performances of these fake musical numbers that they're getting they're making up on the spot they do a little scene into it and then they make up the song and then at the end of the first act you vote on which song should win the phony award and then that okay. show you see in the second act all right cool and then and so that one's running through the end of the month or yes through june 30th so and a new show every time so even if you saw even if you've already seen it or seen it in another town because they've been touring for like 12 years just all around the country it's uh doing this show maybe, or all around the world excuse me don't want to limit them to the wow. domestic market so a little bit yeah. like the improvised shakespeare company although know, their their focus is on broadway yeah it's cool very similar. That's a All great right. comparison. Well, good. Well, I'm looking forward to getting out to that uh, tonight to check it out. So, um, um, well, okay. So, uh, well, as usual, we're going to review some of the latest shows that we've seen. Some I mentioned some of the, the new reviews that we've got on the site, as well as our weekly list, our top 10 uh, Colorado headliners. So, these are shows of particular interest that we think you should try to catch or that we've seen or to, just to kind of uh, put on the radar. Uh, Also later in the podcast is a a really fun interview that I did with Caroline Bowman, who's been playing Elsa in the touring production of Disney's Frozen for five years now. So Elsa uh, Frozen is no longer on Broadway. So she's pretty much this is it. This touring production is the only way to see Frozen right now. And uh, and she was great. She's it's a really fun interview. She was telling me things like, you know, how she still gets nervous when she's winding up to sing Let It Go, you know, because it's such a well known song. And, uh, and yeah, and I kind of felt like I, I was talking to Elsa. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, someone who's played the yeah. character, she's, it's really, she's really, uh, close to that character so, so much. And, and, uh, so, uh, it, it's a really fun conversation. So, uh, but yeah, it's plenty of chances to see it. It's a long run, uh, from June 19th to July 3rd. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I will, I'm looking forward to seeing that. I have not seen, uh, I've not seen the Frozen stage production. I know you saw it back when it was here. Uh, in Denver in the tryout back in, what was that, 2017? Yeah, I I think, uh, I don't think that I saw it. My wife saw it uh, and actually... Your wife uh, saw it. Yeah. That's right. Uh, but I, I'm, I'll be there Thursday uh, and you'll be there as well. That's right. Yeah. I'll see you at the show. It. Yeah, I, I like Frozen. It's a good, it's a great Disney movie, so... Um, anyway, well, uh, some, one of the things that we, uh, kind of our main topic this week is disappearing theaters and, uh, maybe even a little bit of toxic culture in the, uh, I don't know, I don't know if it's the Colorado theater community or the Denver metro area theater community, but there's a, you know, I don't know, some, some social media stuff that we wanted to, to dive into because, uh, it's kind of interesting. So. So, uh, yeah, so just in the past week or so, we've learned that two of our, I don't know, sort of our favorite, like really great theaters in the metro area, Curious and Benchmark, are, are giving up their homes. Uh, and Ooh. then also the Esquire. Can you tell me a little bit about the Esquire? I've never, believe it or not, been there. Yeah, so it's run by the Landmark Theaters. Uh, and earlier this year, and I think it was around March, they announced that they would be closing their Esquire Theater location um, just to be, and it was going to be repurposed into upscale apartments restaurants and things like that oh, so previously yeah i know uh, but uh the city was clear it's going to be through their adaptive reuse programs i guess we, they call it 
historically accurate gentrification that they're going to be doing over there. But nevertheless, it's a big loss because this venue, in addition to showing independent films uh, in this space, it also housed a number of live performance acts. Like they were kind of one of the main hubs for Colorado is Elusive Ingredient, which does the Rocky Horror Shadow Cast production each month. And they are losing that spot there. In addition, they also hosted other smaller comedy acts and open mic nights and things like that. So it was a real space uh, for creativity. And so it'll definitely be a loss for the neighborhood. Oh, man. Well, yeah. Well, so, and tell me, uh, what do we know about um, Curious and Benchmark and their situation? Yeah. So Curious Theater, uh, as we reported earlier this year on the podcast, they ended up, uh, they launched a Fund the Future campaign to try to raise money in order to save the space. Uh, and they ended up not meeting their goals uh, to uh, with that campaign. So they decided to put its longtime home at the uh, on the market. Um, and so they're going to be just exploring different models here. We don't actually have a ton of great answers at the current moment. Uh, they're still looking. They listed the building at the moment. They do not have. They have uh, some people who have looked at it. No active bids, to my knowledge, as of recording this on June fifteenth. Um, but yeah, they're going to be switching to being a nomadic troupe, more similar to local theater company and Betsy, uh, who have been doing this for years, along with another a number of other companies. Yeah. Yeah, so the Acoma Center there, it's an old church. And I, I got to be honest, I mean, the handwriting was on the wall. You know, you, I mean, mm -hmm. that's it's really expensive to keep a building like that, you know, up to speed. And I think it needed, uh, you know, lots of renovation, and roof and all, all kinds of Correct. other stuff. And they were looking for, there was a big ass, they were looking for three quarters of a million dollars, I think. Um, that's right. And even if they got that, I don't know, how long could it be sustained even after right, that? Right, because... I, from my knowledge of the situation, that's from the future campaign was just to pay down their additional, their current debts, as well as do the additional maintenance that they needed to keep the building operational. This was not to kind of like a big, set them up for a big right. next phase or really be able to do a full remodel. It was just to get it operable. And so I, I, yeah, I totally agree with you. The writing is definitely on the wall. Uh, that last, the last show that I went to, Kalakwada, on opening night, there was definitely kind of a sense that it was, it, it felt kind of like the last time. Right. Yeah. And the kind of shows they do, they're they're not necessarily filling the house uh, all the time. It's, so. Yeah, that's totally true. And I think that that's very similar to the situation that Benchmark found itself in, too. That's another company. I mean, I... I personally think that Curious and Benchmark are doing some of the most interesting artistic works, and they often really knock it out of the park. But there's no denying that often when I am sitting in those theaters, I am one of just a handful yeah. who is in the space. And, and in my conversation, I chatted with Neil Trugolo and Haley uh, Johnson, who are uh, well, very artistic uh, and executive director over at Benchmark about this decision last week. And they were pretty candid about that. It was just like they would do shows like Blasted, which both you and I, we showed up. Yeah. We really and we were we, we really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a really difficult experience, but I thought it was yes. ultimately a worthwhile artistic, very artistically fulfilling to go and challenge myself in that way. But uh, we were, it was one of the really successful shows to date. And so when you're trying to build an audience, particularly at the pandemic, that's not the kind of momentum you need, particularly when you're trying to also pay rent. And so ultimately, they also made the decision to kind of cancel the rest of their season this year. And they, as of uh, June 2nd, they moved out of the space. Yeah. Yeah, that, it's a different story in that, that 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 building is nothing special. It's kind of a nondescript mm -hmm. uh, building uh, there. But, you know, it was a good space for them. But, I mean, I don't think they should have trouble finding other venues to work out of. Yeah, it, it was over 1560 Teller Street over in Lakewood. Um, a little bit, kind of a little bit out of the way for everybody, unless you live over in Lakewood as well. And I agree. I think that Benchmark is going to, They've got a good reputation within the community. Haley, Neil, and Mark uh, Stith, who are over there, the leadership team, they've got a lot of connections. So I think they'll be able to land on their feet. And I, I just, I hope that they do, can, they do come back because I think that benchmark curious, they're, they're doing work that other companies just aren't. Neil was honest. He was like, we, 
if we were do we could go we could always turn to the canon he said and do yeah. a show that's been done like 16 times music man. maybe people might <laughs> see the 17th time exactly he used the example of cabaret which i mean yeah how many productions of cabaret have we seen recently i mean yes. there's one that's at the freaking tony's this year uh, this yeah. year again so um yeah yeah I, I think it's particularly hard for companies who aren't doing these things that have a built-in audience particularly as they're coming out of the pandemic trying to rebuild audience and other expenses are going up so the the room for error is just a whole lot lower right um you mentioned another one backstory theater in broomfield uh, i don't know too much about that space children there are children's theater over in broomfield and they've uh, kind of they just recently moved into a new space and they were expecting to have another tenant who was going to help them kind of shoulder the cost of rent. However, that it, agreement ultimately ended up falling through. And so they've faced significant financial difficulties. They ultimately, their executive and artistic director, uh, Nigel Nultz, uh, left in March after the board cut his salary to about a third of what he was prepared to take Ouch. in response to this. Uh, yeah, it was it was really hard uh, there. And he was very, uh, Nigel, to his credit, was very understanding. He He was very much just like I understand that this happened. this is for the company, but I absolutely cannot accept that salary as a yeah. human being. Yes, <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> it really just highlights that kind of struggle to find sustainable income and community support uh, in the current uh, landscape. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I was talking to Chris Medina from Funky Little Theater Company in Colorado Springs, who was on the podcast uh, last last time. Uh, you know, they've moved around a couple of times and they, they, they did eventually find a home at a, at a, uh, kind of a, like a community center that's owned by the city of Colorado Springs. So, you know, the plus side being that, you know, there's, it's a city owned facility. So they get all that backup, you know, the, the downside being you've got to deal with, you know, a big bureaucracy that's, you know, may have different ideas about things, but, uh, I think a lot of theaters are going to be looking at, at, you know, how do you balance those things? Yeah. I, I, I'm hoping that maybe this, kind of departure from these spaces um, can maybe lead to a new wave of innovation and potentially collaboration between uh, current venues in the space. I know that uh, Vintage, with its next season, it announced two co-productions uh, on its lineup with two nomadic troops. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really positive step in the right direction when it comes to actually uh, putting your money and your support to where your mouth is and being like, we want to build this vibrant theater community and support each other. Why don't we work together? Absolutely. Uh, and, and we also know that there's a lot of these places sit empty uh, a lot of times. It's <laughs> another great point. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, maybe maybe a theater can go in and do the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, uh, slot or, God forbid, Mondays. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, I totally agree. I mean, like, other you see other venues around town, and I know the music business industry and the theater are not a one to one comparison, but they're both audiences who are coming out to see live entertainment. And the Ogden, the Ball Arena, they, these spaces can sell out on Mondays and Tuesday nights. I don't think there's any reason that with the proper marketing efforts put behind these theater companies and these interesting collaborations, that theater companies can't be doing the same. Yeah. Yeah, time to think outside the box, as they say. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you had a, another theater that you were talking about on Santa Fe Drive. Yeah, it's just up the road from where Sue Teatro's space is now. It's the Aslan Theater on Santa Fe Drive. And they're a movie theater and performance space over there. And they're also at risk of being uh, at, kind of going away as well, but for slightly different reasons. Then because the property taxes, uh, the owner over there, uh, his claiming to, that the city is forcing him out because they have doubled the value of the property to near to about $1.65 million, which increased his tax bill from $22,000 to $37,000 a year with no additional increase in income and no help for support or willingness from the city to kind of understand that even though he's property rich, this owner is very kind of cash poor. So right, right. really considering selling over there, which a lot of local advocates in the community argue it would be a huge loss because this his base has been a huge uh, supporter of the Chicano community for decades over there. So it would just be a very historical space to the community that would be lost uh, due to kind of city uh, meddling. Yeah. 
Well, you know, a lot of these these property tax things are kind of baked in, and so if if you want to cut deals or help people out or help businesses out, and, and this is this spills over onto the residential side quite a bit, uh, and there's been you know a lot of movement in the state legislature and things, but you know, I think a lot of times the, the municipalities are like, eh, I'm not sure what I can do, and they're very happy to take that additional income, and uh, you know, to their detriment, you know, what's going to go in there? Another you know, freaking mattress firm or something, you know. Probably. I, 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 honestly, though, knowing that strip, uh, what's going to go in there is a high-rise apartment. Yeah. They're going to call it the Art District apartment. They may call it maybe, maybe the Aslan apartments, oh, name it after this. Yeah. I know. I'm sorry. I, I maybe just, like, manifested that into existence. I hate this. That's <laughs> awful. <laughs> so uh, is this the end of theater as we know it? Or, or is this just, a I don't know, a, a growing pain or a bump in the road? Or what do you think? I, I don't know. I don't necessarily think it's the end of theater because it, it, you do still see kind of these bigger spaces, uh, like spaces like the Denver Center uh, and Candlelight still being able to thrive uh, when they're doing these big shows and programming the entire year. I think that what this maybe can do is just hopefully strengthen the theater community to collaborate more with maybe local businesses, schools, cultural institutions around town to kind of really build up that trust and get people back interested in the arts community and back through the doors and i think that's going to have to be through maybe some uh, smart season planning smart marketing efforts and really good collaborations and there are some spaces around town um that people can go if they don't have their own space i mean you you highlighted a few right yeah there's um you know i mean you mentioned the boulder dairy there's the, the people's building in aurora which uh is, has been a great space for you know of course the um um, Two Cent Lion is in there as the kind of the, the in-house company. Uh, there's the Roaming Gnome over in um, Aurora that I think is is open to some. Uh, Buntport is really cool about, you know, renting their space out for very low cost to, to anybody who wants to use it. And then there's other places like the Lakewood Cultural Center, which is, you know, where you see performance now uh, doing their shows. And, and that is a beautiful theater that I'm, I don't know what else is in there. I don't know how, how big of a lineup they have outside of, you know, performance now, but I mean, that's, you know that's a that's a good one. I, that probably wouldn't be a good one for say benchmark, even though it's in Lakewood, uh, just because mm-hmm. it's kind of on the big side. Uh, and then uh, you know there's a couple of others that you were thinking of as well, right? Yeah, I know for rehearsal spaces, kind of over in Denver, the Three Leeches, uh, they rent out rehearsal space and backstory over in Broomfield, who I mentioned just a second ago, is renting out rehearsal space as well. And then uh, you've got the Bug Theater and the Elon Wolf Theater at the JCC, who rent out spaces for performances in Denver, as well as over in the Boulder area, you've got the Nomad Playhouse, E-Town Hall, and the Canyon Theater over at the Public Library. So there are spaces, and then there's also these kind of other traditional, maybe less traditional theater spaces that I think people are kind of underutilizing, potentially including like schools, churches, and uh, yep. just other community spaces that are available, often for pretty cheap, or these organizations are willing to make deals. Yeah, and they they may not be ideal. They're probably kind of a great like light setup or you know dressing rooms or stuff, but you know. Uh, the the love of theater the passion can uh, you know if you can get the audience in there they're going to be more uh you know you can do that kind of thing and without ideal situations so, uh yeah and, and you know thinking outside the you know the metro area i know there's a lot of um a lot of the kind of the wealthy mountain towns like uh have have created spaces some of which already have like an in, uh, in-house company like the breckenridge theater which has the back the backstage theater in it so uh, you know uh i think most theater companies that are looking for a space are, are going to cast around and, and find stuff that, you know, they, and mm-hmm. figure out whether it fits in their budget or if it fits into their program. And, uh, and you know, as you mentioned, some theaters that have their own space can, uh, you know, help those that don't and also uh, help themselves by maybe getting a little bit of uh, additional revenue uh, from that. So, yeah, totally. And I, I, I think the kind of final point on in this conversation I wanted to raise is just like the roles of audiences in this situation. Uh, in my conversation with Neil, he said something that really stuck with me. Uh, he said, if you want these things in your town, like theaters and arts organizations to be viable, you have to show up to support them. 
not just theater, but it's anything you love. If like, if you like that we have a ballet, but you never go, guess what? Pretty soon there's not going to be a ballet. You don't right. show up to support the things you claim to value. They will go away. I, I just think that we have, we as audience members, maybe not just you and us, but you and I specifically, audiences collectively have a lot more control over the theater scene that exists here in Colorado than we give ourselves credit to by what we show up to or more honestly, what we don't show up to. Yeah. And, you know, it also harkens back to the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago about arts journalism and that role of, you know, marketing, whether it's earned media, paid media, whatever, you know, there's there's lots of things you can do beyond just, you know, buying expensive ads in Westward, <laughs> the Denver Post, whatever. Totally. It's funny. It's funny you mentioned that. Neil made that same comparison. He said, like, it's all connected to the, the decline of journalism really hurts organizations, particularly like Benchmark, he, he noted, because unlike when you're doing uh, Beauty and the Beast or something or Cabaret to continue our kind of comparison, it doesn't matter what the critics say. People will see the name. They'll either go to it or won't based off of the name recognition. All right. This show like Blasted. You really do kind of need that community, that support, somebody, an advocate, a look, somebody going in and being like, this is the best thing. You need to go out here to see it. And so when you have less people doing that, it becomes harder and harder for those voices to get out. Slash, they've got to get craftier in their marketing and figure out how to adapt to this new ecosystem that we're living in, which is challenging. Absolutely. Uh, So you had uh, kind of three main things that you think theaters can can do. Um, did, Did have you touched on all those? Um, I touched on the first one already. So kind of the collaborative programming, the co-producing. I think another op- good option that we kind of jumped around and alluded to is more resource sharing, uh, like lending out or renting out your space for things. I know Miner Alley is definitely interested in doing stuff like this with their kind of collaborative build space that they've got beneath the theater. And then I think just finally is like figuring out financial and list- logistical ways that you can, can kind of support each other. Maybe any, I it's so hard because i know theaters are already a very tight mar- industry with like low margins but just figuring out ways to assist with grant writing and fundraising efforts for other theaters without their own spaces even if it's something just as simple as sharing it on your own social media shouting out these other companies who exist in the area so um, i think those resource sharing kind of collaborative programming and financial and logistical support are my big three areas right yeah, and uh, I, I would also mention that I, I met with uh, Kristen Crampton Day with the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts, and that's also a great resource. Uh, they also have uh, uh, one of their programs is uh, like pro bono or pro uh, whatever free or or low cost legal advice for for companies looking to get grants and and uh, nonprofits looking to get grants and things like that. So you know, in addition to Looking to the other members of the theater community, there's also some some other organizations that that help out. And um, yeah, okay. So you know, in the spirit of cooperation, uh, you know, that we were just talking about, there's also uh, apparently there's some people out there that feel that uh, maybe that's a little bit lacking. There was uh, on the Colorado Theater Guild Facebook page, uh, uh, somebody named Jace Johnson uh, wrote, uh, you know, is anyone else feeling heartbroken by the state of regional theater in Denver post pandemic? There used to be so many more opportunities for actors. Now I'm lucky to sing, see a single audition posted for a job within the city. There's no sign of recovery. It's such a shame. Uh, I feel like what was already a small business is shrinking out of sight. And it generated like 38 comments, and some of which were mm-hmm. um, pretty caustic or you know, had a pretty grim uh, view of, of things. So play, playwright Mike Brommel wrote, The old ways haven't worked for a decade. It predates the pandemic. Uh, a group of us long ago left the traditional community theater model behind and never looked back. Um, you know, and uh, you know, said that they've they've found uh, that even taking the shows and moving them beyond to other destinations beyond Colorado, so that they can actually extend their run of a, a show for years, not just a couple of weekends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought that was interesting that. And it, the sentiment was definitely kind of expressed by a number of folks on, on the thread who were just kind of a lot of very direct contempt for what was dubbed, kind of dubbed the traditional theater model or the call like the closed Colorado theater scene. Um, and there were some people who were pushing back. Like I saw the audition, audacious theater director uh, right in the comment section. She brought up the fact um, that 
these auditions do get posted quite a bit in the Colorado Theater Guild, um, as well as on the Facebook page where people are kind of doing doing these things, trying to get the word out. But they often find for their shows, and they do immersive shows kind of, that they find uh, for their thing that is outside the traditional model, people don't show up. So they were kind of also being like, it's you, this is you're saying these things, but then you don't show up for the opportunities that are available currently within the community. Um, and so I thought that was an interesting tension in there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that Lyra Maris, uh, stage manager extraordinaire, uh, kind of pinched mm -hmm. in and said, you know, I, I think she said, I think it's a great opportunity for a lot of places to reimagine how they do business, the old ways no mm -hmm. longer work. And we can't count on subscribers and programming, uh, and things have just got to be more varied to attract a younger audience. So, uh, you know, we know that, uh, you know, you and and my, my 22 year old son Andy are often the youngest people in the theater uh, at a lot of shows, and uh, there's Very something often. that theaters are always trying to do. Um, and uh, you know that's probably maybe a topic for another time is how do you attract uh, younger audiences to theater? So yeah, because unless it's something like I imagine when I go see Frozen, that's going to be packed with young audience members. But unless it's something that's really a family show get aimed directly at like kids not really that's not really who i think theaters and totally need to be focusing on it's a very important sector children's theater children's education is incredible but a little bit older as well as how do you get that age range in as well what are they interested in definitely yeah. a conversation for another day but yeah some sure. some folks in the thread are not interested we're not really interested in having that at like one trixie carwell just was stated quite frankly i cannot wait to move out of this town I have a story regarding disgusting can cancel culture in this town. Denver Theater is very gossipy, negative club. The reason it's going down the tubes is the mentality that has been allowed to propagate here. Only the chosen few get gigs. If they don't like you, they'll ruin you and your livelihood. Denver's breakdown deserved based on disgusting. Uh, Denver's breakdown is deserved based on the disgusting behavior of its competitive, jealous community. They deserve it. So, Damn. yeah, it's a kind of a full-throated indictment of the community and that kind of closed nature that I alluded to just a second ago. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's just a couple of opinions. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, true. I, I don't think everything's all, you know, rainbows and unicorns, but uh, I, most of the people I meet in the, in the theater community around here are pretty darn nice and welcoming and, and all that. I, they are, but I guess I also can't help, but also acknowledge the reality that I have a ton of friends who are like my age in the community who are like, Every week I'll get a call or a text from someone who is like, I'm moving. It's just not tenable here for one reason or another. So it's, a, it's hard. There is definitely something that's not quite working within within the current industry. And so I think law are as common uh, that it's a great opportunity to reimagine how we do business is super fitting. Right. All right. Well, on that note, uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, uh, look at our Colorado headliners, plus my interview with Caroline Bowman, who is Elsa from Disney's Frozen. So stick around. We'll be right back. On Stage Colorado is supported in part by the Colorado Fine Arts Center at Colorado College. Tickets for their upcoming season are on sale now and include Dial M for Murder, The City Dog and the Prairie Dog, In Her Bones, and The Naked Mole Rat Gets Dressed. More at fac.colorado.college.edu. On Stage Colorado is brought to you by the Aurora Fox Arts Center, whose production of The Lightning Thief, the Percy Jackson musical, runs through June 23rd. Adapted from the first book of the best-selling fantasy series, the show springs to life with dazzling special effects and a riveting pop rock score capturing the imaginations of children and adults alike. Tickets at auroraFoxArtsCenter.org. The Onstage Colorado podcast is also sponsored by Town Hall Art Center, whose production of The Prom runs through June 23rd. Big city stars set themselves on a collision course with small-town PTA politicians in this sequin-covered musical comedy. Get tickets at townhallartcenter.org. Support also comes from the Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, Betsy, whose upcoming season starts in July and includes Grounded, Enemy of the People, The Ballad of Paula Aguilar, Little Women, Hope and Gravity, and The White Chip. More information? at Betsy.org. All right, we're back here with the Onstage Colorado podcast. I'm Alex Miller. And I'm Tony Tresca. And, and we you... hit our top 10 headliners this week. Yeah, absolutely. We've got, a, got, we've got 10 this week uh, from all around the state. 
uh, I guess I can start us off over in the Boulder area I'm, with the Boulder Comedy Festival that's yeah. coming up. It's June 19th through 23rd. It's at uh, multiple venues, uh, including Junk Art Social, the Dairy Art Center, Thinking Garb, and Boco Ciders all around Boulder County. They've got dozens of comedians who are performing on the roster. Um, I got a chance to chat with the founders, Zoe Rogers, who founded the, who they hosted their first one, uh, in 2021. And she just sounded super excited about the lineup. She was at Curate this year. This is the most venues, the most comics, and they hope uh, the biggest audience turned out. So get those tickets now, June 19th through the 23rd. And uh, is that story out? It is. Uh, it's out in Boulder Weekly. It's kind of a. It was a piece not directly about the Boulder Comedy Festival. It was kind of a look at the operations of festivals around the state, including the Colorado Music Festival, the Durango Play Fest. Um, we'll talk it to in a second. Um, and like Cree Repertory Theater. So all these kind of different community uh, leaders talking about how they run summer festivals. All right. Uh, well, my first one is Frozen, Disney's Frozen, I should say, at the Buell Theater. It's the touring Broadway show we just uh, we talked about just a little bit ago. Uh, and uh, we'll have an interview with uh, with the Elsa um, actor here in just a little bit. So that's all I'll say about that one. Uh, so that's uh, going to be running from the 19th of June uh, all the way into early July. So um, that's a great one to take to uh, to take the kids to and adults yeah. as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And I've got another one that's good for good for people of all ages. It's Legally Blonde, the musical over at Parker Arts. So this is the musical adaptation based off of the Reese Witherspoon movie about a young woman who, after getting broken up with, decides to enroll in Harvard Law School to win back uh, this her man. But it ultimately becomes about a lot more than that. She goes on this wacky wild wind journey. Uh, at the law school where she uh, learns about herself. And the, uh, so that musical is running June 28th through July 21st uh, over at Parker Arts. And is that a Sasquatch production? It is. Yeah, it's Sasquatch Productions, and it's being pr- done by an entire, uh, entirely female uh, production team over there. Right. All right. Well, my next one is one we've also already talked about, Broadway's next hit musical. So uh, we we kind of covered that off, but I'm definitely looking forward to going to see that. So my next one is High School Musical, uh, another one based, another movie, uh, musical based off of a movie. I, this one is based off of the Disney movie about Troy and Gabriella. Troy is a basketball star. Gabrielle is more of a quiet science person, and they're unlikely romance that flourishes in a theater. Uh, so it's uh, I really enjoy. I think this musical has a lot of really fun songs. It's being done in Johnstown uh, at Candlelight Dinner Theater. So you get dinner and a show up there, and I think this one will be a lot of fun to see on that stage. I'm looking forward to seeing how they do the basketball sequences, yeah, in particular. Yeah. All right. Uh, my next one is up in the hills in uh, Carbondale. POTUS or Behind Every Great Dumbass or Seven Women Trying to Keep Him Alive. And this is at Thunder River Theater Company. Yeah, the title. The title, title. is one of those a great title. Uh, and uh, this one's directed by Kate Gleason, who's a pretty, pretty well known uh, director around here. Uh, and uh, it's got a great cast. I can't remember. I know Missy Moore, who's Thunder River's artistic director, is is going to be in it. Uh, great comic actress. Uh, and, and then um, uh, a bunch of others. And so I would also say if you haven't been up to you know if you're up in like the aston or glenwood springs area carbondale's kind of in between there it's a great little town with uh, uh, a, a wonderful downtown and uh, it, thunder river has its own really cool theater space in there so check that out if you happen to be out that way june 14th through 30th yeah sounds fun i've not been up there so i maybe have to get there and it's a great script to go yeah need to drive for so my next one's also a bit of a drive for anybody located in the Bowler, Denver area, but it is the Durango Play Fest. Uh, it's coming up June 25th through 30th at the Durango Art Center, and it features stage readings of four new works. So you, we're uh, going to be, do, be doing All That Remains by Richard Dresser, Circle Forward by the Hyatt, Hop That A by James Anthony Tyler, and Miss Einstein by Kathleen Cahill. Uh, over there. And so they've been working with these playwrights for a little while uh, now, kind of curating these four artists from around the country. We'll bring them to Durango and present them to the public uh, June 25th through the 30th. 
All right. You know, I have never been in the town of Durango. Someday. I can't say that I have either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I've lived in Colorado on and off for, you know, since 1980. So I have no excuse. Uh, I've driven past the way, you know, on to Point South, but uh, but I've heard they have a wonderful program down there. So um, uh, coming uh, up uh, further north, uh, back uh, close, a little closer to town, but uh, at Rocky Mountain Repertory Theater uh, is going to be doing Kinky Boots, which is, you know, nothing new, but it's a fun show and it kicks off their their repertory season. Uh, and they're also doing uh, The Music Man. Uh, and come from away, which are come from away has become sort of a is becoming sort of a staple of its own, even though it's on the newer side. It's a great musical. I mean, it's I uh, it's about this like weird Canadian town that took in a bunch of plane passengers on the day of nine yeah. eleven, and I the music is really touching. I think it makes a lot of sense for companies to do because it's you can really sparsely stage it, or you can kind of do it pretty lavishly and it works really well because the story and music are just that powerful right yeah and i don't think the town was weird it was just an odd situation <laughs> you're right you're right i, I mischaracterized it slightly i i my apologies to any of our canadians listen, listeners out there or anybody from that town i do not mean to offend you guys thank you for your service during that difficult time for the world <laughs> all right so all right what is what else have you got tony my final pick is uh, Ground It by Betsy. I know you just did an interview with uh, Ann Penner, who is great the actor. Yeah. great act, local actress. And this play is, uh, has been, she's done this play several times. Um, and it is a piece about a pilot, fighter pilot who is in the U.S. Air Force who uh, gets assigned to the Chair Force uh, in a bunker outside Vegas for an unplanned pregnancy. And there... She and other pilots are at computers operating drones in bombing raids thousands of miles away. And so it's kind of this introspective piece kind of reflecting on this situation led by what I am told from Mark Reagan's review, which he wrote for Onstage Colorado know, before he was at yeah. Betsy, uh, is a really just, just leads to a stirring performance by Anne, which I believe. Yeah, I did an interview style story with her and she talked a lot about, you know, talked a lot about how you uh, manage uh, being on stage all by yourself and and kind of the ways that she and uh, director mapped out like sort of a grid like this, this part of the stage represents this and, and this is that and uh, some of the, you know, the beats that they figured out to, to make it all work. And uh, yeah, so uh, but, and yeah, if you look at that story, there's also a link to, to Mark Reagan, who's who's currently the, the kind of the managing director of Betsy, mm-hmm. uh, which he, you know, he wrote this, uh, he's, he wrote a couple of reviews for us. Uh, and then he just, I think he just got too busy. But uh, it's kind of kind of interesting that we have <laughs> Mark's uh, review on there. So um, cool. Well, the last one I have is Twelfth Night, uh, and then it's at Open Stage in Fort Collins. Uh, Twelfth Night is a is a great Shakespeare show. It's a great, I don't know, maybe sort of entry level Shakespeare. Uh, Absolutely, show. yeah. It's and kind this, of a musical comedy because it's yeah. got so many songs. Yeah, it, and it's wacky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, and uh, and it's also outside at the at an area called the Park at Columbine Health, and it's running June eighth through July thirteenth. I did notice that their show last night was canceled uh due to thunderstorm so there's there's you know that's alfresco theater is always going to have that uh that that hazard uh, but you know you don't want to get that, that tornado sweeping everybody uh, out, of, out of there <laughs> yeah and so late so uh, i'm just going to mention a couple other shows that, that are we have uh, reviews up on the site or that we will have soon so uh our reviewer april took Saw four old broads at the Funky Little Theater Company, uh, and uh, you know I'm I'm sorry to say that that one will be closed by the time you hear this, but uh, uh, it sounds like that was a, a great one. Uh, and then I will do my best to say this correctly: Fuente Ovejuna, oh, Fuente Ovejuna uh, at, at Wheat Ridge Theater Company. So Eric Fitzgerald uh, reviewed that on the site. Uh, an old Spanish play, like several hundred years old, uh, that they did there. Yeah, I think it's like what fourteenth or fifteenth century. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I think fifteenth century. Yeah, uh, and then uh, up in Silverthorne at Theater Silco, they're doing Moriarty, which is uh, you know another Sherlock Holmes derived thing, uh, but that was written by uh, the uh, Ken Ludwig, I believe. Uh, yeah. And then uh, 
Two Cent Lion Theater Company, their uh, show Josie's Diner is at the People's Building in Aurora. They debuted it at the Denver Fringe Festival, and now it's up there uh, for a few weeks. Uh, Buntport Testing 1, 2, 3. I will have a, a story about that here pretty soon. We talked about that earlier, but uh, definitely lots of fun to get out to Buntport and see that. And then Conifer uh, Stage Door Theater is doing Sweeney Todd. Uh, I will be at that one. And then uh, I will try to say this without cracking up. The, at the Butte Theater in Cripple Creek, they're doing something called Darling Donkey Derby. Darling Donkey Derby. <laughs> <laughs> which of course is like a melodrama uh, but judith sears our reviewer down in the springs was like yeah i'll, I'll go check it out because we've we've never reviewed any of their shows at the butte and uh uh so yeah that's a long-standing program down there so uh interested to hear what judith has to say about that one so so check all that out on our site at onstagecolorado.com and if you hold on uh, we'll get to my interview with caroline bowman who plays Tulsa in the touring broadway production of frozen uh, which will be opening here at the denver center this weekend yeah, Caroline. Caroline, okay. Good mm-hmm. to know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking. I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So, hey, we're here with Caroline Bowman, uh, who is going to be at the Buell Theater uh, in the Disney's Frozen production, the touring Broadway show uh, as Elsa. So, Caroline, thanks so much for being on the Onstage Colorado podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's great. And so you have like, man, what a cool role to play. And you've been doing it for a few years now, right? Yeah, I've been doing it for five years minus a pandemic. I have uh-huh. been, I'm the original Elsa on tour. All right. Well, so what is it? Obviously, you, you really like this character. You wouldn't keep, keep doing it. What is it? Uh, what do you love about playing Elsa? I do. I love so many things about her. I mean, I love that she is a woman that's coming into her own and she doesn't quite know where she fits in the world. And then you watch her discover how special she is on her own. I mean, she didn't. um, And then I love her song she gets to sing. I love that it's a Disney show. I I just love so many things about her. Um, I love her costumes. I love her hair, <laughs> you know, on a superficial level, you know, I just love, I love it all. I love it all. It's been, it's why I've been able to play this role for so long. That's great. So, uh, you know, I haven't seen the, the uh, musical, so I'm looking forward to, to coming to it uh, next week, but uh, I have seen the, the uh, the film and you know the film was known uh, you know the the let it go song was kind of really famous for the, the the initial performance that was in the film uh which it's got some really it's a really challenging song to sing is that uh is that still something that you really enjoy going out there and and, and doing absolutely there's never a day i'm not nervous because i know everybody knows that song right um, so i have to kind of release that um expectation of what people um, want from the song granted i do I have been singing it for a long time and I, I have to, in order to sing the song correctly, I have to kind of let it go. <laughs> um, right. And, and it's so fun. And the magic that happens on that stage is, I mean, like you've never seen before. I mean, the, the, the it's, it's really incredible. Um, but I I do I do really love doing that every day and I have I have a blast and the way my heart races still to this day is is a test like it's why I've been able to do this role for so long because uh-huh. I still get a thrill it's a thrill and I have to give everything I've got I have to give everything I've got and it's wild it's really takes it out of me <laughs> I sleep really well after playing this role <laughs> I bet. So, you know, this is Disney's Frozen. You know, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, ad-libbing or impro- improvising or anything in a show like this. But, I mean, how has your understanding of the Elsa character changed over the years that you've been playing her? Are you still finding things about her that uh, that are new? Or Absolutely. I mean, I think because I think that's the gift of of playing her this long is that I kind of now, because I know the story so well and I know you know, I know all my lines, I know all the songs, I, I kind of get to play, I actually get to play. And that's, I get to play within the realm of the world. And I'm like, Oh, maybe she's thinking this here, or maybe, or depending on how I feel that day, she, her, um, 
uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's fun to kind of continue to deepen my understanding of her. And, um, I really kind of know what she's thinking at every moment. And I, I, I have this level of trust in myself and in the knowing of the role. And, um, that, you know, you don't always get as an actor, you don't always get to do a show this long and play a role this long. So I, it's, I get to play within, within her, you know, and I get to play vocally with, with, um, her songs and, I'm really trusted by the music department and I'm trusted by our creative team. And so I just kind of get to live on stage and it's, I'm, I'm discovering new things about her all the time and where I can be more playful. And, you know, she is a really, she's, she's a cold character for lack of a better word. I mean, she's, yes, she's the ice queen, but she is dealing with a lot of internal trauma and, and, um, anxiety. And so I try, I got to find ways to, she is a young woman. So she does have a playful side and she does yearn to have this relationship with her sister, which is filled with love. And so in order to find a way to make her a more interesting character, I have to infuse that there has to be playfulness and there has to be love there and warmth. And so Playing with that has been fun because nobody wants to watch somebody deal with anxiety for two hours on stage. That's not why people go to the theater, right? So it has to be an escape and it has to be why, why is she like this? And so I ask all those questions and it's fun. It's really fun. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, she is uh, among Disney princesses. She's really, uh, she's on the darker side uh, and, and a very complex character. And, you know, I can see how, um, especially like girls and, and teenagers in the audience might relate to so she's accused of witchcraft and she's been kind of ostracized <laughs> and all that and does it seem like i don't know with with all the news about social media bullying and all that do you think is that part of the reason elsa still resonates with with fans yeah sure i think i think absolutely she is a character that is totally misunderstood she's she's being told she is not allowed to to really show her gifts that she was given she was born with and she's conditioned to believe that she is dangerous and uh, uh, you know just all these things that are super problematic especially to a young kid and then you grow up and you don't quite know who you are and i think i think a lot of people can relate to that and so she's kind of this like character that people look to because she does overcome that and she does get to be free um within herself and she does have she she learns that people will accept her if she is if she stands firm in who she is and her power and um so i think i i think that's really empowering to young and old alike i think people come and and are are like I I feel I feel close to Elsa, and and that's a responsibility that I don't take lightly. I I know what she means to people. I know what she means to me, um, and my story and who I am. And so I I try to honor that people are coming and and I think also even people who come to see the show not expecting to be emotionally carried away. They, I t- they tell me at the stage door, they're like, wow, I was, I did not expect to cry that much or I did not expect to release that much. So I think it's a more emotional experience than people expect coming to right. see the show. Yeah. And I was also thinking, you know, there's this, this isolation uh, that she deals with that might have been especially poignant, you know, sort of around the pandemic or, or after, mm-hmm. after it that, that people would have related to. It's like, you know, she was the ultimate, uh, you know, <laughs> distancer. Um, but uh, uh, you mentioned talking to uh, some of the, some of the reactions that you hear. How much do you engage with the fans, uh, and uh, and what's it like to meet them? I mean, I, I I'm 
usually stage door, usually, you know, and obviously every single stage door of these theaters are different. So it depends. Sometimes there's a lot of people standing there and sometimes there's not. So that's when I really get to see people in person. Um, but yeah, I've, I mean, I've had some really, there's been really special interactions with people and, um, people want to share their stories with me at the stage door. And obviously I have to create a little bit of a boundary there <laughs> or else I'd stand at the stage door, um, for an hour right, after the right. show and I do have to do it twice a day sometimes. So, um, but it's, it's touching. It's touching. People want to tell me what Elsa means to them and, and how much the show means to them. And people come back. I mean, I've, uh, I've met people around America who have seen the show multiple times and I'm like, how, <laughs> how? <laughs> I just think, you know, <laughs> I don't, you, they clearly travel to come see it because the show is really important. And obviously the show is not on Broadway anymore. So we're the, we are the American, uh, Broadway version of Frozen. And, um, and, it's it really does touch my heart. I mean, the fans of the show are are really special to me, and um, I, 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 it's it, it infuses my it's infused in my performance. These stories people have told me, and and how Elsa has gotten them through, and how much she me you know people the kids that this you know this movie came out in twenty thirteen so. It's they're grown they're grown now you know and but it's still important to them you know this was a part of their childhood and and then the, the new generation of kids are still watching it it's still important to them so you know it's a it's a story that's resonating with people for years and years and years uh, yeah. I don't think I think the frozen hype is going to continue <laughs> um, and you know is this the kind of show where do a lot of the the, the kids show up with uh, costumes or dressed up. They do. They do. And that's, I think that's really special too, because they wear their little, they wear their gowns, their Elsa gowns mm -hmm. or their Anna gowns. And then the parents are dressed up too, which I think is kind of, um, special because when I was a kid, I would get so dressed up. I'm from Maryland. And so we would go to the Kennedy Center and, um, it was this big event. And so we'd get put on our best outfits and, I was always told to get dressed up for the theater. And I feel like that in over the years, it's been a little lost that it's not as heightened of an experience. And so I feel like it's kind of re reinvigorating that idea that theater is, is an elevated experience and that um, you get dressed up and you go to have this experience that only happens once. And so I love it. I love that the kids are getting that dressed up because it kind of makes everybody get dressed up for the theater again uh, uh -huh. and have this experience. So, uh, yeah, it's cool. That's, that's right. really neat. <laughs> that's great. Um, so, and, and also you've got superpowers. It's got to be cool to play a character that's got superpowers, right? Oh, yeah. It's my dream. It's my dream in life. I want to, I'm like, I want to be a, uh, uh, a Marvel or DC. I want to be a, superhero in a movie so that's that's my next goal <laughs> so <laughs> i've done it on stage so that's great so um all right well um that's this is great carolyn uh, bowman it's uh, wonderful talking to you i look forward to seeing you on stage and I, i'm sure that the the gang the kids and the adult parents and, and anybody else you don't have to be a parent or, or a kid to enjoy uh, enjoy the story it's it's one of my favorite uh, of the disney stories in the last you know 20 years or so it's, it's really great so Oh, I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thanks again. Uh, so, uh, Caroline Bowman will be playing Elsa June 19th through July 3rd at the Buell Theater in Denver. And uh, we'll be out there to see you. Yay. I can't wait. I love Denver. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Caroline. Okay. Bye. Well, that's it for this week's episode. I really appreciate Caroline Bowman taking the time to talk to us. You know, it's, uh, she's a mm -hmm. very busy actress and uh, um, is touring the country and the world with this show. She's been all over the globe with it. And uh, so it's, it's really fun to catch up with her. So um, subscribe to the Onstage Colorado podcast wherever you get your audio and let other theater lovers in your life know about us. Uh, be, also, be sure to check out all of the reviews, news, uh, other podcast episodes and our full statewide theater calendar on the website at onstagecolorado.com. 
Yeah, and if you have any thoughts on the podcast, feel, please feel free to share them with us on our social medias or via email at info at Onstage Colorado. We'd love to hear from you, and we'll read any comments that we get, uh, provided they aren't discriminatory or anything like that, on the show. So we'd love to hear from you and what you want to hear us discuss next week on the pod. Uh, and definitely feel free to rate the podcast wherever you are listening at the moment. All right. So you, uh, you've got a couple of five-star uh, reviews we've gotten recently. What the, who's, t- who's saying stuff about us? <laughs> First one is from Jane Reuter, who is a past contributor to the site and a current reporter over at Colorado Community Media, uh, who says, you know, her five-star review, best resource there is for all things theater in Colorado. Very thorough calendar. Also impressed with not only the quantity of reviews, but the geographic area the reviewers represent. It fills a much needed void in the theater Yay, world. Thanks, so, Jane. Thank, thanks, Jane. And then I got another one here from friend of the podcast, Julia Toby, who said, really appreciate Onstage Colorado's coverage of local productions and the Colorado theatrical landscape. Fair, informed, thorough commentary by seasoned theater goers. I applaud their hard work, dedication, and time invested. Bravo. So... Thank you so much to both Jane and Julia. We really appreciate your kind words and we're thankful to you as well as all of our podcast listeners and site viewers for tuning in each week. We really honestly couldn't do this without you and wouldn't want to do it without you. So we're always open to suggestions for how to make this even better. So just make sure to don't be a stranger. Reach yeah. out. We'd love yeah. to hear from you. Yeah, we, we're always looking for topic ideas. Uh, and sometimes Tony and I look at each other like, what are we going to talk about this week? And we always think of something. So <laughs> <laughs> but we'd love to hear from, from you as well. So, uh, all right. Well, uh, well said. Uh, we look forward to connecting with you uh, soon. Uh, and in the meantime, I am Alex Miller. And I'm Tony Tresca. And we'll see you at the show. Oh, yeah. <laughs>